The proteins found inside our body consist of 20 different amino acids. And seven of these 20 different amino acids have readily ionizable side chain groups. And what that means is the side chains can basically lose or gain an H atom at a specific pH value. And so for a specific amino acid that is ionizable, at certain pH values, the side chain will have a charge, but at other pH values, the side chain will be neutral. Now, to see exactly what we mean by this, let's take a look at the following two examples. So, these are the two out of the seven ionizable amino acids. We have cysteine and we have lysine. Now, for the case of cysteine, the side chain group that is ionizable is the following group. So, notice the sulfur atom contains an H atom. But when the pH value reaches the pKa value of this side chain group, namely 8.3, what that means is this will begin to lose our H atom. And at the pH value of 8.3, exactly half of the cysteine amino acids will exist in this form and the other half will exist in this form with a negative charge on that sulfur. Now, if we go above 8.3, then this group will predominate. If we go below 8.3, this group will predominate. Now, for the, case is, uh, for the case of lysine, the end of the side chain group that is ionizable is this group shown here. So the same exact thing is true for this particular group. At this pH value, when the pH is equal to the pKa of this group of 10.8, then half of them will exist in this form, the other half will exist in this form. If we go below a pH of 10.8, this group will pre uh, predominate. If we go above a pH of 10.8, this is the group that will predominate. And the same thing is true for the other five readily ionizable amino acids. Now, since proteins consist of different combinations of these readily ionizable amino acids, what that means is they will have different net charge values at some specific pH value. For example, they will have different net charges at the physiological pH of around 7. Now, what it also means is that every protein will have a unique pH value at which the overall net charge on that protein, on that polypeptide, will be zero. And this will be the case. At a specific pH value, all the charges on all our amino acids on that protein will exactly cancel one another out. The net charge will be zero. And this specific point is a property of that protein because the protein is unique. It consists of a specific combination of these amino acids. In fact, the pH value at which the protein has a net charge of zero is given a special name. It's called the isoelectric point or simply PI. So every, po uh, every protein contains this isoelectric point. Now, some proteins, if they consist of the same exact combination of ionizable amino acids, they will have the same isoelectric point. But usually, proteins have different values, isoelectric point values, because they have different combinations of these ionizable amino acids. And because this is another property of proteins that is unique to most proteins, we can use this property to basically purify our protein. So if we have a mixture of different types of proteins, we can separate and isolate specific proteins from that mixture by using a method known as the isoelectric focusing method. So the isoelectric focusing technique is basically a method that we can use to purify a mixture proteins by using a specific property of the protein we call the isoelectric points. So let's take a look at the following diagram which basically describes the setup of isoelectric focusing. So in the setup we basically create a special type of gel and we create a pH gradient along that gel. So let's suppose we take a gel, we take the gel, we place the gel into a special apparatus and we create a pH gradient. And what that means is on one side, let's say in the left side of our gel, we're going to have a low pH acidic environment. On 
the other end, on the right side, we're going to have a high pH, a basic environment. Now we're also going to connect both ends of that gel to a voltage source. We're going to create an electric potential difference between the two sides and that will create an electric field. And we'll see why that's important in just a moment. So once we set up this apparatus, what we do next is we take our mixture of proteins and we essentially place it into our gel. Now what will begin to happen? Well, what will begin to happen is the proteins will begin to migrate, they will begin to move. Why? Well, because the proteins will have a net charge and whenever they have a net charge, they will move within an electric field as a result of the interaction between the electric field and the charge, the net charge on that protein. So for instance, if we take a protein that contains a net positive charge and we place it into our field, it will begin to move towards the negative end. And if we take a protein that contains a net negative charge, it will begin to move away from this end and towards this positively charged end. Now the proteins will continue moving along our gel until they reach the pH value at which the overall charge is zero. And when the overall charge is zero, because there is no net charge, those proteins will no longer move along that electric field. So when the protein reaches its specific isoelectric point, the PI value, it will be, it will stop moving within that gel. And so if we, for example, have a mixture of three proteins that each have their own unique isoelectric point value and we place them into our mixture, they will separate until they will separate and they will stop moving when they reach their PI value. So for protein one, the PI value is acidic or relatively acidic. For protein three, the PI value is relatively basic. And for protein two, it's somewhere in the middle. So it's essentially neutral. So once again, in isoelectric focusing, a gel with a pH gradient is created. The two ends are connected to a voltage source, a battery, and the proteins are placed into our gel. Now each protein will move due to the presence of an electric field as a result of that battery source. And so when they reach their PI value, the isoelectric point, they will stop moving because the net charge at the PI value of the protein is zero. Now, of course, this method is not very useful if these three proteins have the same combination, have the same number of these ionizable amino acids because what that means is these three proteins will have the same exact value for the isoelectric point. So they have to have a different isoelectric point value for this technique to actually be useful in separating our proteins. Now, the question is, how exactly, do you de uh, how exactly do you determine what your PI value is for a specific polypeptide? Now, before we determine what the PI value of specific proteins is, let's ask the following question. How do you determine what the PI value is of a single amino acid? So let's take a look at the following four cases. There are four cases that we basically have to remember. So case number one, let's suppose that the amino acid is not ionizable. If that's the case, if the side chain is not ionizable, then to find the PI value of that particular amino acid, to find the isoelectric point, we simply sum up and we take the average of the pKa values of the terminal alpha amino group and the terminal carboxyl amino group uh, and the terminal carboxyl group of that particular amino acid. Remember, every single amino acid contains an, a terminal alpha carboxyl group and a terminal alpha amino group, and those two groups are also capable of losing and gaining H atoms at specific pH values. So if the side chain is not ionizable, then the isoelectric point of that amino acid is the average of the pKa values of the terminal alpha amino group and the terminal alpha carboxyl group. So 
So one example of a non-ionizable amino acid is glycine. Another example is valine. We have alanine, leucine, isoleucine, and so forth. So let's take a look at glycine. So glycine contains the H atom side chain group, and that means it is not ionizable. Now, at, a, at some specific temperature value, the pKa of this particular uh, alpha amino group is 8.0. And for this particular alpha carboxyl group, let's say it's 3.1 at that same temperature condition. So in this particular case, all we have to do to find the pI value of this amino acid is simply take the sum of these, divide by 2, and we get the average. So we have 8 plus 3.1, which is 11.1. .1. We divide that by 2, we get 5.55. So the pI value for glycine is 5.55, assuming these are our pKa values. Now, these pKa values might change if we change the conditions under which this amino acid is in. So, in your textbook, or maybe your teacher might give you different pKa values, and that's because the temperature conditions or other conditions under which that amino acid exists in are different. So, let's move on to the second case. If the side chain is ionizable and that ionizable side chain is acidic, then to find the pI value of that amino acid, we simply take the average of the pKa values of the terminal alpha carboxyl group and that side chain. So to see what we mean, let's take an example. Let's look at an ionizable amino acid that is acidic. So we have two cases. We have aspartate and we have glutamate. So let's take a look at aspartate. For aspartate, this is our side chain group. And the pKa value of aspartate is 4.1. Now, this pKa value is the same as above. It's 3.1. So notice they both have negative charges and that makes sense because if these, if both of these groups give the same type of charge, then to basically cancel out the positive charge, we have to average these two negative charges. And so we average these two pKa values. So 4.1 plus 3.1, that gives us 7.2. We divide that by 2, that gives us 3.6. So what that means is, at a pH of 3.6, these two negative charges from these two groups will exactly cancel out this positive charge found on this uh, terminal alpha amino group. And so at this particular P, uh, pH value, this will have a net charge of zero. Now let's move on to case number three. Let's suppose we have an ionizable amino acid, but it is basic. So that means there are three different amino acids that fit this category. So we have lysine, we have arginine, and we have histidine. Now, in this particular case, what we have to do is we basically take the sum of the pKa value of that side chain group and the pKa value of the alpha amino group. We divide that by two, we get the average, and that is our isoelectric point. So let's take a look at lysine. So lysine contains this side chain group, and the pKa value of lysine is around 10.8. Now, the pK value of this alpha terminal group, uh, alpha amino terminal group, is 8. So, notice once again, in this case, we had two negative charges on two different groups. In this case, we have two positive charges on two different groups. So, now instead of summing the, uh, this and dividing by 2, we sum this, divide that by 2. So, we get 10.8 plus 8, that's 18.8 divided by 2, gives us 9.4. So, the pi, the isoelectric point for this amino acid, which is basically lysine, is equal to 9.8. So at a pH of 9.8, these two charges will exactly cancel out this negative charge that is found on the alpha carboxyl group.
And finally, let's move on to case four. So if we have an ionizable side chain group, but it is neither basic nor acidic, so we're basically dealing with two cases, and these two cases are cysteine and tyrosine. If the amino acids are cysteine or tyrosine, the, uh, to calculate our PI value, we have to determine what the middle pKa value is out of the three different pK values and then we take that middle value and we basically sum it with the terminal alpha carboxyl pK value and we divide that by two. So to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following uh, example. So this is our uh, tyrosine amino acid. So tyrosine has an ionizable side chain group but it is neither basic nor acidic. So the side chain group is this phenyl group. So the pK value of this is 10.9. So in this particular case, because it is ionizable, but neither basic nor acidic, what that means is out of these three pK values, we have to find the middle pK value. So we have 10.9, 3.1, and 8. So this is our middle pK value. And then we average this value and the pK value for the alpha carboxyl terminal group. So we take 3.1, we add it to 8, we get 11.1, divide that by 2, we get 5.55. So in this particular case, if the pK values are shown, then the PIV